I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the high points of this that I don't drill in on in the slides or in the videos, but I, but I think are important to, uh, um, to look at. Now, one of the things that uh, everybody faces as a professional these days is this problem of information overload. There's just so much stuff available, and you have to discriminate between which things you're going to pay attention to and which things you're not. And uh, I talk a little bit about this in uh, some of the things that we're reading. But you know, what, you know, you, we need to narrow the search space. I mean, that's that's how people in computer science talk about this stuff. Uh, this is one of the important areas of theoretical computer science. How do you narrow the search space so that what you're looking for is likely to be within what's left, the residual, you know, the thing that you're going to spend time searching, uh, and deleting a lot of the other stuff where searching is going to be fruitless because you don't have the resources to invest in that. Now, Shannon, and this is an important thing to remember, Shannon basically said, I don't care about content. I don't care what the message is. I just care about the channel. Right? So Shannon got rid of content in order to focus on the channel. But once we figured out how to make the channels work a lot better, the content came back in as, as the crucial thing. Right? So this, this has been repeated time and again in the history of technology, where people said, look, let's not worry about that problem. Let's worry about this problem right now. And they focused on this problem. And pretty soon, this problem got solved, or things became better, and then suddenly it was back to the other problem, right? So if you go back and look, and Shannon worked, worked uh, published a lot of his stuff in the, uh, um, uh, eight, uh, during the uh, heyday of the AT&T Bell system, a lot of what he worked on was telegraphy and telephony, and uh, what people were interested in there was controlling the noise. Uh, they were enjoined, the AT&T common carrier was enjoined from paying attention to content. They were legally prohibited from paying attention to content. They weren't supposed to listen in on your calls. They weren't supposed to be involved in anything like that. Uh, if somebody wanted to wiretap you for law enforcement purposes, that had to be approved by a judge. Uh, there was a you know, legal review, judicial review. Um, AT&T was concerned about one thing, and that's does the signal get from point A to point B? That's what they cared about. That's what Shannon was caring about. And as I said in the previous uh, talk about this, uh, when I started with computing back in the day, I mean, you know, now you know, people will have these cool laptops on their desk. I had a data media terminal and a uh, 300 baud modem with an acoustic coupler. That's how awesome I was uh, back in 1980. And, you know, people would come to my house and say, my God, what is that? You know? Uh oh, uh, well, you know, it's like very scientific and dangerous. And, uh, you know, I have to kill you if I tell you. Um, but, you know, basically it's like computing. Uh, I'm hooked up to a computer. And, uh, you know, people are like, whoa, you know, this guy's hooked up to a computer. And guess what I was? I was hooked up to a mainframe computer. This is, you know, the enormous power of the time. Now, a 300 baud modem with acoustic coupler, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd dial the phone number and it would squeal, you know, through the telephone and then you would stick it in these uh, rubber cups. Uh, and 300 baud was like 300 you know, characters a second. It's like, why would anybody want to go faster than that? <laughs> it's like, that's like faster than I can type. Right? So, hey, it's cool. And, you know, almost all this stuff was <laughs> for writing papers and doing email. I mean, nobody, everybody said, yeah, I'm doing computation. You know, yeah, right, yes. writing email. Um, but, you know, pretty soon, it, these things were running at 1,200 characters a second, and then they were running at, you know, 2,400 characters a second, and 9,600 characters a second, and then 56,000 characters a second. And all of this was happening because of the kind of work that people like Shannon did. They did error correction. And when things are moving at the speed of light, you can actually do a lot of stuff, and it doesn't look slower to the user because what's happening is so fast to start with, right? So 
you know, I remember when I first started in this business in the early 1980s, um, I was talking to people and they were saying, well, we think the upper bound, the upper limit for, for transmission over uh, category three copper, which was the standard for the telephone system, is, uh, you know, probably you know, 10,000 characters a second. And like within a year, we were going at 56K. And then it went up from there. And all of this was due to error checking, and error correction, of much of the coming out of the research that Shannon and people like Shannon were doing, because they didn't care about the content. I mean, they don't pay attention to what the message says. They're only worried about what the channel's doing, right? Now, once we got very high speed channel capacity, content came back in. Now, I want to bring up Einstein. In the early part of the 20th century, Einstein had what has been called since then the Annus Mirabilis, the, the, the miracle year, where he published a whole bunch of papers in, in German physics journals. Uh, and these papers completely shook the world of physics. I mean, everybody was like, who is this guy? And he was, he was working in a Swiss uh, government patent office and so forth and so on. Um, now, these papers were the reason that he won the Nobel Prize somewhere, some years later. And people still look back on these papers as the sort of high point of Einstein's illustrious career. What did he do? He thought about time. And what he thought about time was really very simple. Everybody else assumed that time is a constant. Time doesn't vary. Time is always the same. And so whenever they would write their equations, and they involve time, uh, Time was a constant, right? It's always held the same. And Einstein basically said, why is time a constant? Why don't we assume time can vary? Let's make time a variable. And lo and behold, all this stuff started falling into place. The general theory of relativity, the special theory of relativity, uh, you know, all of these things sort of became into, came into grasp because he relaxed the constraint on time. Now, this was a huge breakthrough at the time because a lot of people didn't think that this was possible, right? Time was just everybody's mindset. Time is fixed in the discussion. And Einstein said, why is it fixed? Let's let it vary and see what happens. And, well, he changed the world of physics profoundly. Now, this is an art. When to tighten up constraints and when to relax constraints is an art. And I want to tell you a, a, a kind of a practical administrative story about this that uh, some of you can relate to. When I was dean of the School of Information, we had our first ever student with a particular learning disorder. And everybody was like, oh my god, what are we going to do with this person? Well, it's, it's, it's not like this person sneaked in or anything. I mean, the application said, I have this learning disorder. And everybody said, oh, yeah, like, we, we accommodate people with learning disorders. That's not a problem. And then this person showed up and was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we've never had anybody like this in class. Um, what, what, what happened? Hmm? What, what happened? Well, if mind, sorry, no, I don't know. so, so let, me, let me start off by saying this student's parents were extremely powerful. The person's mother used to be the general counsel of the University of Michigan. That is, the chief lawyer. So, excuse me, not only was this person a lawyer, but it was our lawyer, right? And so, this person knew where all the rules were, right? And had gone off to be the chief lawyer for the NCAA. So, uh, there was kind of a big sign on this person, don't mess with me, right? And the other person in the picture was this student's father, who basically went around with the student to make sure the student was taken care of. Now, the student had actually been an undergraduate at Michigan and had done very well. Uh, so the first thing that we ran into was this student is not like other students. And Olivia Frost was the associate dean at the time, and she came to me and said, 
this is completely freaking me out. We've never had anybody like this. I said, well, that's the first question I answer. How come we've never had anybody like this? Because this isn't the first time in human history that this kind of learning disorder has been apparent. And the answer to the question is really very simple. They started letting people like this through. Right? Mainstreaming, you know, disability stuff, you know. It's like this person is normal, except for their abnormality, and you know, you have to treat them as though they were like anybody else. And these people never got to us before. They were shunted away from us much earlier in the system. Well, times change, rules change, these people start showing up. So that's the reason why we had to deal with this. And of course, that says something very important, which is this won't be the last one. And by the way, it wasn't the last one. We've had a lot of people like this person since uh, coming into the school. But, but this was the first one. So Olivia and the rest of the student affairs group didn't know what to do about this. And I said, well, the first thing to do is relax the constraint. This student isn't a student. What we're dealing with here is a student team. There's one of the parents who's the gun behind the door. It's going to blow our ass out of the water if we step out of line. Uh, the other parent follows this student around to make sure that we don't step out of line. Uh, then there's a, a person from the Office of Disabled Student Services who's a very strong advocate for this person. And, you know, eventually you get to the student and, and, and you realize this person is not capable of being a student in the way we normally think of as a student, right? The way we've been thinking of students in the past, they have these characteristics. Some of those characteristics aren't present in this person. Right? So you have to think about the performance of the student team, not the student. It's like, oh, well, that means we have to change some of the rules. It's like, well, we're already changing the rules, right? So you give this person a test. There's a university regulation that says they have to get more time, right? So the rules are already changing. It's not a question of whether we're going to change the rules. It's a question of how we're going to change the rules to deal with this case, to this case, okay? Now, to make a long story short, the person graduated and went on. And along the way, we had to make some decisions about where our responsibilities ended, right? So we were obligated to give the student an education. We're not obligated to make the student a professional success. And I hate to break it to you all, but we're not, we're not obligated to give any of you that promise. Um, you know, because that's one of the things we figured out. Uh, you know, that's not... That, that's not in our power to do that, and it's not our obligation to do that. So we don't, we don't advertise that everybody who comes here is going to be a professional success because that gets into territory that we don't control. So this whole business, this what I put up here is the contribution of the knower to the known. This is a really important epistemological truth. Okay? A lot of what you understand is because of what you impose upon the thing that you're trying to understand. Right? There's, this, there's this notion that is prevalent in education, but particularly problematic when students believe it, uh, which is that if you stare at something long enough, it reveals itself to you. It's like, uh, that's not how it works. You, wor you, you learn by perturbing stuff. Now, in addition to having two dogs, uh, my wife and I actually have, actually have two children as well. Uh, and they're a lot older than the dogs are. In fact, they're like 150 years old in dog years. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in their late 20s. Um, so this is a, uh, something that we learned early when they were around two years old. Because when children move from being like 18 months old 24 months old, they really change. And they start acting differently. And you've you know, heard, heard about the terrible twos and all this kind of stuff. You see all kinds of behavior that you didn't see before, and it freaks you out. Um, well, it freaked me out until I read an article, <laughs> which seemed right to me. Uh, what this article basically said was, um, what in developmental psychology, what children figure out when they get to be around two years old 
is if they scream and push and hit, they learn a lot more. That is, if they perturb the environment around them, they get more information. And what do they want to do? They want to learn. So get out of the way. Here it's coming. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't take a two-year-old and say, now look, I understand what's going on. <laughs> you know, you've got to stop this behavior. It's not okay. You know, it's like, ah! and that's the answer you get. And it's like, oh, all right, that's not working. Um, so basically you live through this period. They're, they're going through this because this is what they go through. It's one of the things they're kind of programmed to do, if you, if you will. So they're perturbing the environment to get information back. That's one of the things you've got to do. Now, it shows up in, the, in this business about science and engineering perspectives. Because if you look at what science and engineering does, it perturbs its environment, right? I mean, there wasn't an experiment. An experiment is you hold a bunch of stuff down and you drive the bejesus out of some of it, right, to see what happens. Like, you know, we, well, we basically tied this critter down and then we kept poking it until it got really angry. And then we learned some stuff. And it's like, you know, it's, and now, now we have IRBs and human subjects and things like that that control our behavior around that, but that's pretty much what happens. You, in a controlled experiment, you hold some things constant and you try to explain the variance of the stuff that, that's not being held constant, right? So you're perturbing the environment. Now, with systems thinking, you are perturbing the environment but you're doing it largely through thought experiments, right? You're not, you're not necessarily doing empirical experiments. You're not necessarily spending a lot of time and energy and money and, and other resources to conduct these experiments. You're looking at things and you're thinking, how does this work? What makes sense here? So systems thinking isn't very good if you don't understand systems, right? So you. In order to be good at systems thinking, you have to understand something about systems, and that's one of the things we're concentrating on in the class. Nearly everything today is systems, right? We've, we've been working on systems pretty much nonstop for well over 100 years now. We were doing it before Ross wrote about it in 1904, or the late part of the 19th century. Uh, we were thinking systematically about things, even if we weren't using that language. Uh, and then, of course, during the 20th century, uh, we, we really got serious about this stuff. Now, thinking is always useful. You know, one of the things that should separate you guys who get graduate educations at a place like this from people who don't is your ability to think things through. Right? If, if that's actually not something we're being successful with, that's a real problem. Right? I mean, that's, we need to be pretty introspective about that. But beware of technocratic views. Okay, now, so systems thinking is a technocratic way of thinking about the world, but you have to be careful about technocratic views. And we're going to come back to technological determinism. It's one of the key things in the, uh, in the videos. Okay, building, testing, using, and then catastrophe. Now, almost everything that results in a catastrophe has been used and tested and built, right? I mean, that, that stands to reason because, I mean, a natural disaster, okay, that's natural. We, we don't control that, the, or at least not very directly, even with changing weather. If it's anthropogenic, it's not something we're doing on purpose uh, in most cases. But, you know, the I-35 bridge collapse, uh, you know, in, in Minneapolis, uh, there's a little clip on that uh, in the uh, videos. Um, that was because of bad gusset play. You know, inadequate thickness of gusset plates. Gusset plates are, are these plates that hold chunks together on the bridge. Now, nobody intentionally made uh, the decision to put up gusset plates that were too thick. It was a mistake. Now, it, it, it could have been a conspiracy, but it was, if it was a conspiracy, it was a stupid conspiracy because the thing didn't fall apart right away, right? So, you know, you, you had to wait for 20 years for the thing to collapse. Um, you know, that's a long time to wait for a terrorist incident. So, uh, you know, they, 
it was a mistake. And so there's a legitimate question then about how that mistake occurred, uh, the Challenger uh, accident. This concept of normal accidents, uh, we want to talk a little bit about that. Charles Perrault is an interesting guy. Uh, he came out and gave a talk one time at the institution I used to be part of. And uh, I picked him up at the airport and drove him around. And uh, we got to talking. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting listening to him. Now, he had just published his article on normal accidents. He hadn't yet written his book. Uh, but his, uh, his article was, became quite famous. And it's available to you in PDF form if you, know, if you choose to go look at it. Uh, normal accident at Three Mile Island. Now, Three Mile Island was before many of you would remember. But it was one of the worst uh, nuclear accidents, nuclear ge power generation accidents in, in U.S. history. There was a partial meltdown of the core and so forth, and it was, it was a serious issue. Not as not as big as the you know Fukushima Daiichi uh, problem, but but bad. And uh, everybody was like, "Oh my God, you know, this was really a huge anomaly." Well, Perrault was the only person who looked at this and said, "No, this is a normal accident." This is an accident you could expect to happen. And that's what attracted some colleagues and I to his work. And uh, so he, um, he generalized this into a book on complex technologies and so forth, uh, which you, know, you, you can kind of follow up on. Now, one of the things I alluded to in the uh, materials and in the follow-on uh, videos and so forth uh, in the section was this idea that this is been very popular for understanding catastrophe. And why is that? You know, I mean, think, think about why it's easier to explain what has happened than to explain what's going to happen. This one should be pretty easy. It's, well, it already happened, right? So you have the existence proof that it already happened. But also, you have the ability to go back and look in detail at it. You can't look in, de at, in, in any detail at the future. You know, the future's out there, right? It's, it's, it's amorphous. But what actually happened can be investigated. So this is part of the reason why systems thinking very often shows up in retrospective analyses of systemic failures. This is a really, really important point. So be on the lookout for people who talk as glibly about projective capability with systems thinking. This is what's going to happen as they do about what has happened in retrospect. It's, 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 they're two different things, right? Just because you can understand and explain systemically what happened in the past doesn't mean you can forecast the future. And our, actually, our forecasting is, is very poor. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is one of the things that I, I, you know, last week I was part of a uh, uh, strategic planning e exercise. And the strategic planning exercise at one point got off into the, well, we have to forecast because that's how we know what's going to happen. It's like, uh, you know what's going to happen? Uh, what stocks should I buy? Uh, which sports teams should I bet on? You know, I mean, everybody wants to know what's going to happen because you can become really rich really fast if you know what's going to happen. But it turns out to be kind of hard to know what's going to happen. Uh, we're constantly being surprised by that. So anytime the essence of somebody's argument is, I can predict the future, you need to stop and stand back and say, oh, yeah, you've probably are the only person I've ever met who can, right? And it turns out that and he, and the problem is not that nobody can predict the future, because there probably are some people who can predict the future. We just don't know who they are, right? And there's lots of people who say, I'll predict the future. Which one do you listen to? Nostradamus. You know, every few years, Nostradamus shows up. You know, look at this, at this quote, you know, the white horse fell over itself and then ran down the hill. And that clearly means that Google's going to lose money. What? Yeah, I, I don't think so. It's like, yeah, for sure. And then Google loses money. It's like, he was right. Nostradamus <laughs> predicted it. It's like, uh, okay. You know, um, 
it would be nice if, you know, we wouldn't actually need to have a university if people just could see the future. They wouldn't need to actually know anything except what's going to happen. You wouldn't need to have people doing research. You wouldn't need to have people thinking about why things happen the way they do. All you'd have to worry about is making sure that you were set up right for what's going to happen. That turns out to be impossible. Circular motion, general systems theory prison. The, the essence of this is once you get it, you got to get back to work. right? And what's the it? The it is that there are systems within systems within systems, right? This is one of the deep insights of systems thinking. To the extent that systems are connected to one another, to the extent they're embedded with one another, uh, um, nested or whatever you want to call them, uh, yeah, that can be a really valuable insight. But it becomes intractable in a hurry. The combinatoric explosion of possibilities alone just exceeds your capacity to follow. Right? So pretty soon you're guessing. Right? And, and usually it's not too many moves out. You're, you're guessing wildly. Because the, the possibility space has expanded from a few dozen or a few hundred to a few billion possibilities. And it, it just becomes intractable. You can't keep track of all of this stuff. It's just not possible. Now, are we doing better with computers? Um, kind of. I actually had an interesting discussion a while back with a friend of mine who's a, a pilot, um, and he's a, a pilot trainer, so he actually knows a lot about avionics and stuff like that. He said that uh, the 787 is causing fits for airline pilots. Now, it's certainly causing fits for Boeing, but uh, why is it causing fits for airline pilots? The avionics in the 787 are so sophisticated, they can kind of reach forward probabilistically and cover all kinds of contingencies that might occur and figure out what to do about them, right? So in the simulator, you can actually create circumstances that have maybe a one in a, a million or one in a billion probability of occurring, but they, it's, a, it's a finite possibility that they would occur. You can create these situations and the avionic systems are like, yeah, no problem. You know, here's what we do. Well, remember what I said last week about most of the stuff that you read has been written by humans? And humans tend to have kind of a human-centric view of things. Well, one of the things that has historically been true about airline pilots is the airline pilot has to be able to override the computer. But the computer avionics in the 787 are so sophisticated, they haven't had any humans who can work faster than the computers. So nobody's gotten certified on the 787 avionics because the machines are out in front of the people. And the people have to be able to control the machines. You know, this is, this is an unwinnable fight, right? They're going to have to relax their constraints. They don't have any choice. They're going to have to say that, you know, if it's a one in a billion thing, maybe you just flip the switch that says, let the computer do it. <laughs> right? And uh, is the computer right or wrong? I guess we'll find out. Right? That's pretty much all you can do. Um, if, you <laughs> if you read the uh, uh, Nukes of Hazard piece, this uh, uh, review of the um, command and control book, you'll, you'll, you'll get some of these. Uh, horrific stories about how things almost went up in a whoosh and we were lucky they didn't. Um, so coming back to the circular motion thing, I, one of the things that I say in there is if it doesn't halt, it doesn't work. And this is one of the simplest things to look for. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to spot it right away. If there is no clear stopping point for this thing that people are describing, it just goes around and around and around, then it's probably not very useful for predicting things. And a, a lot of stuff has that. And it's charming. It's, it's got its attractive characteristics. But in terms of explanatory power, it's not very useful. And that's a good reason to let it go. Uh, most of the people who went into this general systems theory uh, notion uh, and stayed there um, 
kind of never came back. Uh, you know, they, they, their, their academic and intellectual careers just kind of drifted away. Uh, and in a lot of cases, uh, it was just because they got so enamored of this idea that this, you know, things are nested within each other, they, they just went off in that direction and they didn't come back and say, well, yeah, that's all really interesting, but you know, here's something we can actually do, um, which turns out to be kind of useful. Means versus end, it's, it's, it's very easy to confuse means and ends. Um, and this is one of the problematics of the technocratic perspective. Uh, remember Machiavelli. <laughs> Machiavelli um, is accused by people of saying that the ends justify the means. And actually, he didn't say that. What he said is, this is a problem. When people think that the ends justify the means, you are throwing out important calibrating information. Moral sentiment, sure, it, it, that's, that's one of the things that you throw out. But it's also not even practical. It's not sensible to assume that the ends justify the means. Um, now, he didn't say it this in the way that people would say it today, but there's a, there's a concept in computer science called recursion. And sometimes these things like feed back on each other. It's, it's as part of a, a systems notion. And uh, this idea that you, know, you can simply go with the ends and not worry about the means, that comes back to hurt you in lots of ways. Um, this has been proved time and again in geopolitical context in the last uh, 100 years or so. Um, Technology and systems are very powerful. Uh, this critique that we're making of them is not in any way intended to cause people to say, well, I can just forget about systems and, and technology and so forth, uh, because, you know, obviously it's crazy. Uh, it's not crazy. It's, it's really powerful stuff. You have to acknowledge and humble yourself to the power of it but you also have to be skeptical about it. And let me just give you a couple of examples of this. First one is this guy, Thomas Malthus. Uh, obviously, he died in 1834, so he was um, you know, actually a fairly old guy at the beginning of the stuff that Joanne Yates talks about. He published this uh, famous essay, Essay on the Principle of Population as it Affects Future Improvement of Society, with remarks on the speculations, speculations of Mr. Godwin and Monsieur Condorcet uh, and other writers. Now, this was back when you can actually publish stuff with times that long. And uh, this was in 1798. And one of the famous quotes from this paper is, population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence, that is food production, increases only in an arithmetical ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison of the second. So Thomas Malthus, writing in the end of the 18th century, said, we're basically doomed to starve because the population is growing geometrically, but food supplies are growing arithmetically. Now, you have to ask yourself, is, is that true? And it was true in his time. But he didn't understand and couldn't anticipate the impact of technology. And the impact of technology was really huge. Uh, the Green Revolution, mechanization of agriculture, and the application of chemicals, most of them from petroleum, uh, but not only from petroleum, to agriculture, has dramatically increased the yield of agriculture to the point where, right now, the earth can probably feed everybody on the earth, right? I mean, most, most people who are familiar with the problems of hunger are happy to say that most of the problems of hunger are distributional. They're not, they're not tied to inadequate production of food. They're tied to inadequate distribution of food, right? We have enough calories. Uh, and even the right calories to keep people alive. We just can't get it to all the people who need it. And I, I was just watching on TV the other night, there was some uh, UN report that said that uh, from uh, 2010 to 2012, um, there were, uh, hunger was affecting about 800 million people. That's a lot of people, right? So it's, it's by no means a solved 
issue. But uh, there are almost 7 billion people, maybe 7 billion people on Earth. At the time when Malthus was writing, there were like 1 billion people. So if he was right in his conjecture, and the Green Revolution stuff didn't happen, we would have be, been dealing with this a long time ago. Right? So mechanism, mechanization of agriculture, and I don't mean just the creation of agricultural machinery. I mean uh, large-scale systems aspects of agriculture, bringing water from far away, uh, maybe from far away underground, but bringing water where it hasn't been to where it can be in order for crops to grow. Uh, for example, the Olagala Aquifer in Oklahoma and the um, Great Plains states. Uh, I read an interesting thing about the Olagala Aquifer. People are basically mining the water. They're extracting the water from the aquifer. And the water table is dropping. Uh, so that water was accumulated there over a very long period of time. And the, the um, number I read was that every year of agricultural production dependent on the Olagala Aquifer is using three million years of accumulation. Every year of production using water from the Olagala Aquifer is using three million years of accumulation of water by the Olagala Aquifer. Now, I think I mean, look, who knows if that's right, if it's this one, one year to three million years. But at anything close to that level of consumption, you're going to run out of water because you're going to run out of three million year blocks of accumulation. And the water table has been dropping precipitously on the Olagala Aquifer. The croplands that are fed by the Olagala Aquifer constitute a non-trivial part of U.S. food production. So if we lose that capability, that land goes back to the way it was before they tapped the Alagala Aquifer. And, both, and basically that was the American West. High Plains Drifter, Clint Eastwood, right? I mean, people like that, you know, dusty, no man's land, right? That's, that's what might happen. Um, if you lived in California, like I did for a long time, you saw the water being brought from where it, where it landed by the hydrological cycle in the high Sierras being brought in canals down to where people wanted to grow things like cotton and so forth uh, in, the, uh, in the middle and southern part of the Central Valley. Um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, it's kind of interesting, but, you know. The other, the other thing I just wanted to mention, and, talk about it, uh, other than show pictures about it. That's the, that's the change in, in, uh, in health treatments. Um, my friend sends me this message from Copenhagen saying, well, I was having chest pains, and I went in the hospital, and I got a stent. Um, and now I'm flying home on Friday. 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been the story. Right? 20 years ago, he might have been there for three or four months because to treat him would require really major surgery, cracking his chest open or whatever, right? Now, they, they put in stents now by going in through blood vessels, right? It's, it's, it's not pleasant. I mean, it's not something you, you know, do for fun, but uh, it sure beats having your chest ripped open by a, by a machine, you know, which is sort of what they used to do. Uh, you know, my, as I mentioned, I think, earlier, my, my wife uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer in uh, 2009. If, if she had been diagnosed with the, the breast cancer she was diagnosed with in 1999, she'd be dead. But because she was diagnosed in 2009, she's alive. That's how fast the change has been made. I talked a little bit about the fact that Steve Goodman, the City of New Orleans uh, song writer uh, died of chronic myelogenous leukemia because he was diagnosed and died of that disease before the invention of Gleevec. Gleevec is like a miracle drug. It's a targeted drug. You give it to these people and the disease goes away. Right? It's, it's, it's a really amazing thing. That's just in the last 12 years or so. So 
uh, technology has <laughs> some very impressive uh, credentials. It, it, it doesn't make sense to uh, treat it lightly. But because it's such a powerful thing, you got to think about it carefully. This is just the set of takeaways that I had in the slides that I sent out to you. Uh, past is never dead, context matters, etc. I'm not going to go through all these. Uh, you know, now you have two copies of this. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, as a general rule, when I put takeaways at the top and I list a bunch of things, these are the kind of things you probably want to look at. Okay, so the segue to Yates. Um, what's the big story? Well, I think you can figure it out by now. Social control plus technology means socio-technical control. Right? So uh, we're not just talking about technology, and we're not just talking about social mechanisms, even if they are systems. We're talking about technologically assisted social systems. And socio-technical change is really important. Now, let me just tell you briefly that one of the things that I picked up from work we've been doing on the undergraduate program, which has entailed talking to employers about what they're looking for in graduates. One of the things they say is, the socio-technical perspective is really useful. And when you ask them to elaborate on that, they have a hard time elaborating on that. But they really think it. So, no, of course you can be kind of direct and say, well, I, I'm totally socio-technical. <laughs> and and uh, you know maybe they'll just say yeah you're the one we want, um, <laughs> but uh, you know you might ask yourself why do they think that this socio technical perspective is valuable? It's because they are, are constantly hearing from people, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. There's this technology that's coming; it really matters. And what they don't typically have in these companies are people who can say, yeah, that's really important. That's going to be a game changer over this period of time. Uh, and, well, now that's probably not going to go anywhere. That's, you know, people are really stoked about it right now, but it's probably not going to have the effects that people think it's going to have because of the following socio-technical explanation reasons. Um, if you can do that, that's, that's, that's really valuable. And this is one of the things that Yates starts to get at in, this, in these detailed and kind of rich stories with this overarching framework, which uh, I, I discuss in the, uh, in the new videos and slides. How does it happen? Well, it doesn't happen through miracles. Uh, Yates uses history to explain how these things happen. And what you'll typically find is that it's not just people, it's not just circumstances, it's not just technology. It's some combination of these things. And if you understand that combination, you understand something important about how the change actually happened. And in, and, and in the change, that, that, that explanation of change is much more powerful than well, I don't know, the technology arrived and things changed. It's like, yeah, that kind of in the crude sense that's true, but it doesn't tell you about what you should do. So using the new videos and new slides, technology and so what? Um, well, there's people, resistance, champions, ideas. These are things that are talked about in the Yates book and in, in the videos and uh, slides and systems, the triumph of method over person. This is really kind of the story of the 20th century. If you think about it, if you stand back from the 20th century, which we can do now because we're no longer in it, uh, and we look at the 20th century and say, what, what is really kind of amazing about the 20th century? That was the century where people stood back, and not everybody, there were you know, larger than life characters and still are. But a lot of people sort of stood back from what was going on and said, wow, this thing we've created is really big. It's bigger than me. I might be able to leverage it, use it to my advantage, but there's something really big going on here. And often it comes down to systems. Systemic things that have been done a particular way for a long period of time. And then of course there's a long discussion of functionalism. Do you have any questions about group projects yet or already?
happy to talk about them because they're important. I mean, obviously it's the second half of the class, but uh, I think you'll find when you get into them that this is actually kind of like work. Um, you know, that, you know, you're supposed to become an expert on something and then tell somebody about it and convince them that they need to be thinking about it in a pretty short period of time. And that's, that's a lot like what happens at work. So um, I thought it only fair to uh, give you a, uh, a view of this, and this, is, this falls under, there's more than one way to skin a cat. This is an old expression. Uh, pretty macabre idea if you happen to be a cat. Um, but uh, you know, this expression means there's more than one way to go about doing things. And any topic that you pick, you can approach from more than one angle. And one of the things that you probably need to do relatively early in thinking about your project is what's the angle that we want to approach the project from. So um, I'm going to use this human identity paper, uh, which I've used several years now. Uh, and it's, it's a good example of the tricky topics genre. Uh, and no, you can't do your project on the human identity paper because it's already been done by me. Um, but, you know, it's, just a, it's a nice question. I just thought I'd answer it up front. Uh, and I want to show you, um, as a result of uh, having read this paper and talked to Joe uh, at some length about the issues, that you can come at it from two different angles. And the two different angles that I'm going to come at it at are from the slippery slope angle. That's, that's the first one. And then the second one is the collision course angle. And I'll sort of talk about these at the end. Now, <clears throat> the slippery slope angle. Now, the, the first parts of these two presentations are going to be somewhat similar. Mostly, they have to deal with uh, who, who Joe Vining is, and I won't recapitulate this for the second part. But Joe Vining is a retired professor of law here at the University of Michigan Law School. And he was a particularly important expert, actually an international expert, in animal law. Um, the upshot of his uh, story, and this is you know, going back to what we did in uh, um, Ross and what I think you can do uh, with, with Yates and, and so forth, is um, you know, look at uh, the text of the material that he wrote. And one of the things that he talks about in here is uh, his most interesting ideas, most interesting things that are happening are these advances in genetic engineering, cloning techniques, and stem cell research generally that are making possible the mixing of human and animal cells and genetic material. Okay, so hybrids, uh, you know, chimeras, chimerizing, half horse, half man, et cetera. And then he goes on and he talks a little bit more about this in the paper. And, uh, you know, if you haven't taken a look at the paper, it is, it is up on the c tool site in the readings. Uh, take, a, take a look at it. It's in the, in the chunk two of readings. Um, there's a general paper about projects, and then there's this human identity paper. Uh, the line between elephant for whale on one hand and the flea or fire ant on the other is not merely one of size, right? And this is going to be important in the, in the second collision course discussion, uh, but I'm not going to use it in this uh, first one, the slippery slope argument. The slippery slope ar argument has more to do with identity. Uh, you know, he talks about the eugenic temptation, which is, you know, the, the idea that we can uh, control reproduction. Uh, you, people who were deemed by um, judicial process primarily uh, to be um, uh, inferior in some way. And this was true in the United States, by the way, not, not just in Nazi Germany and other places that you would think of, uh, were sterilized, forcibly sterilized, so they couldn't reproduce. Uh, pretty serious you know, human rights uh, issue. Um, <clears throat> Constitutionally uh, forced eugenic sterilization of human beings, 1926. Oliver Wendell Holmes has this famous quote, and Joe quotes him here. Uh, After extended contemplation of hybridization, we may well put, uh, decide to push back and do none of it, he says. But you know, he's not quite that uh, sanguine. People are going to be attracted by this. For one thing, there's, there's medical purposes to, to working on this kind of thing. Um, so what I want to kind of show is the, I, you know, the, the first one is the slippery slope one, and it's an identity. The assignment of identity is the, uh, is the key issue. 
and I want to use man bear pig uh, <laughs> from South Park as a key thing here. This is uh, man bear pig. It's half man, half bear, half pig. Right? And, uh, you know, fractions may or may not be your strong suit, but I think you can figure it out that that adds up to more than 100%. And actually there's a gag in the show about this where uh, one of the South Park characters, the kids, uh, says, man bear pig is one third man, one third bear, one third pig. And then the other kid corrects him, no, he, it's half man, half bear, half pig. Right, which, I mean, the, the whole purpose of this is, is to make this thing kind of absurd, right? And that's what makes it hilarious. Now, the, the, the show is really a send-up of Al Gore. Um, and so if you like to see Al Gore get sent up, it's you know, definitely worth watching. Um, but, you know, we, we look at Man Bear Pig and we think, you know, oh, this is, well, why do we find Man Bear Pig simultaneously apprehendable and ridiculous and hilarious? Well, it's because we actually know something about hybrids. Um, so this is a, a picture of a mule. And mules actually are pretty handy as draft animals go because they have uh, tremendous endurance. They're very strong. They're very sure-footed. And as uh, animals who could carry stuff, they were in very high demand. I mean, the big production center for these in the United States was southern Missouri. Um, now, mules are hybrid animals. You create a mule by breeding a jack, which is a male donkey, with a mare, which is a female horse. And you produce a mule. Mules are sterile. So you can't get more mules by getting mules to reproduce. The only way you can get a mule is by breeding, breeding a jack and a mare. Now, is it possible to breed a stallion and a jenny, that is a male horse and a female donkey? Yes. And what do you get when you do this? You don't get a jackalope. <laughs> I, I know many of you think that the jackalope is, is the result of that breeding. But actually what you get is something called a henny. Right? Now, a henny is actually not as good as a mule, as draft animals go. So mule breeders paid a lot of attention to this, and over time it was discovered, you know, what bred, you know, good mules and whatnot. And uh, hennies are not very commonly bred because they're not as good as mules. They, they, don't, they don't have the market value. And these are animals that are bred pri primarily for market purposes. Now this gets us into something that's often called the identity problem. And uh, this, is, uh, this is an ax, and um, one of the things that happens in philosophy, I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate, is uh, dealing with this, this uh, identity problem of the farmer's ax. And let me just say that questions like this are what make many people not want to go into philosophy at all, right? But philosophers look at this and it's like, well, that's really interesting, right? Um, so what is an axe? Well, an axe is a pretty simple thing. Uh, is it the handle? I don't know. Is it the head? Those are really the only two parts of this thing. So what constitutes an axe? Let's suppose that you have an axe and you break the handle and you have to put a new handle on. Is it the same axe? Half of the thing has been changed. Let's suppose that a little later you get damaged the head and you pull the head off and you put a new head on. Now both parts have been changed. Is it the same axe? If you're a philosopher, it's like, wow. <laughs> Boy, that's a puzzler. Uh, if you're not a philosopher, it's like, who cares? You know, I'll get the axe and hit you with it. So, um, you know, this is, this is the identity problem. You know, what, what, what constitutes identity here? And of course, we, as individuals, are changing all the time. We're replacing the cells in our bodies and so forth. We completely replace all of the cells in our body over the course of our lives multiple times. Are we the same people? Well, kind of. Now, when you begin to look at this from the assignment of identity, particularly by social processes, you end up with some weird things. 
So consider these two people. This guy you've, you've seen before, Barack Obama. He's half white and half black. His mother was white and his father was black. But under laws that were passed in the US states in the 20th century, Tennessee and Virginia, during what we call the Jim Crow era, under what was called the one drop rule, this guy was 100% black. It didn't matter how much white he had in him. If there was one drop of African ancestry, black African ancestry, he was black. Now this guy, most of you have probably not seen, he used to be on the faculty here, Gavin Clarkson, is at the University of Houston now. He's 132nd Oklahoma Choctaw, which makes him 100% American Indian. It's like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> this guy's, you know, half black, half white, sort of like man bear pig. Uh, and under this one drop rule, he's all black. And this guy is measurably 132nd Indian, and he's Indian. Well, I mean, that's weird. Well, where, where does this come in? Yeah. But I feel like this conversation on identity, and I apologize if I get my opinion. Um, I feel like it's not so much the blood you have in you. Around and this one to maybe the blood, if you will. So, like, for example, the guy on the left, he was raised by his white mother and probably had a white community around him, and very well educated, and uh, married a black woman, and then obviously identifies himself as African American. The guy on the right, though, probably doesn't identify himself as, in, as American Indian or Indian or Native American, um, but at the same time, though, he's probably raised in a, in like a, with, a, with a white culture around him, not an Indian reservation. But if he was raised in an Indian reservation, I would identify myself more as Native American than he would as his white or Caucasian. So I feel like it's kind of your environment, you know, just like how we identify ourselves as like New Yorker. I'm a mm -hmm. New Yorker, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm from Boston, or you know, from Chicago. Or something. It's, um, it's, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the environment may be more important than, uh, th that is nurture, may be important than nature in the conferring of self-identity and so forth. But these decisions were legal decisions. And they came from very different um, notions, very different reward structures. So let me just explain the, the key difference here. This one drop rule was applied to people who would be entirely on the other side of some socio, sociologically constructed fence. Right? They would be black people. They could be enslaved uh, during the slavery era. They would be subject to these constraints under Jim Crow. Yet, American Indians would be treated differently. Now, why, why was this? Why, why did they have this huge discrepancy? Yeah. Land, Land property, true. yeah. Um, if you look at this map, the United States is a pretty big place, right? And as you can see, all this uh, darker stuff is Indian reservations. It's a lot of land. So, and, and you know, once upon a time, there was even more <laughs> of land. That, like this, this state right here. Well, what's that? What state is that? Illinois. Not, 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 not this Indiana. one. Indiana. Indiana. Does the word Indian appear in Indiana? Yeah. And there was a time when Indiana was supposed to be for Indians, right? Remember the Northwest Ordinance of 1787? We're not going to take the land away from these people. We're not going to abuse them. We're not going to shove them around. We're not going to deny them due process. Whoops. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, somebody wrote that. We, we actually don't agree with that, so we don't implement it. Um, we kept moving the Indians farther and farther west. Now, not entirely. I mean, this is a fairly uh, coarse green map. This is actually what it looks like in Michigan. There are some Indian reservations in Michigan. Uh, there's the Little Traverse Bay group, and then there's the Saginaw Chippewas up there and the Keweenaw Bay uh, Indians. Um, and, you know, uh, because these were sovereign nations, they can build casinos. And, and other kinds of things that uh, might not be allowed elsewhere. 
uh, if you look back in the glorious history of the University of Michigan, yes, there's an Indian land story there too. Um, you know, so uh, you know the, the the point that I want to make here is that lots of people who weren't Indians wanted that land. Now, if you're an Indian, you have tribal rights. So they had to figure out some way of figuring out whether you were an Indian so that you could have rights to the land. And if you had rights to the land, you could sell the land to whites. So it was in the interest of the white legislatures to make sure that there was some pathway whereby people who the white people controlled, and basically, could acquire access to the land and then sell it to the white people. Right? This is, this is the origin of the scheme. Now, there, were, there was property involved in both cases, but in the case of slaves, they were property. Right? They were owned by other people. And if you are property or if you own property is a pretty key distinction. So when you get into animal rights, you start to see this problem of identity that Joe Vining is talking about. How do you assign identity? Let me, let me just uh, give you uh, some sense of how socially constructed this is. Uh, some of you may remember this guy, Michael Vick. Uh, and he was um, arrested and tried and actually went to prison for uh, dog fighting. Um, he's now, it was, he, at that time he was quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons and now he's quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. But, uh, uh, and, and he says he's given up you know, dog fighting and stuff. But dog fighting is illegal in most states. Uh, and it was uh, once upon a time legal uh, pretty much in all states and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or an organization, got together to make this unlawful. And uh, this, you know, we are their voice, right? And then, this is actually an ad that appeared with my whole picture and so forth, because the ASPCA was trying to make a lot of noise about the problem of dog fighting and other uh, cruel to animal kinds of sports. <laughs> now there's lots of organizations that do this kind of thing with respect to people, right? We, this is not a surprise. We're familiar with the you know, uh, uh, Red Cross, Save the Children, Oxfam, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these organizations uh, are familiar to us. We see them all the time. And it doesn't, it doesn't strike us as peculiar that there would be advocacy groups, advocacy groups for uh, human rights in this case, nor does it strike us as peculiar that the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals uh, would be there. But we would be kind of freaked out if we saw the International Committee to Save the Cockroach, um, which is something I made up, uh, although I, I think I should trademark that cool logo. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because most people actually want to squish cockroaches. They don't want to save them. Um, and cockroaches are, are kind of gross. And, uh, you know, they, they, they don't seem to be declining in, in numbers. Um, so there's probably no good reason to save them. But if you, if you got a phone call from a solicitor who was trying to raise money over the phone saying, would you please donate to the International Committee to Save the Cockroach, you would probably say, I don't think so. You know, in fact, uh, why don't you transfer me to the International Committee to Exterminate the Cockroach? And I'll donate there instead. Right? So the, 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 the risk in this business, the, the slippery slope, is you know, the categories matter. Identity is at least partly assigned. Right? It's not a foolproof scheme for saying that this is this or this is that. And this, this, this comes back, I mean, you know, you know, Ross is a good example. Uh, you know, you're reading along with the Ross stuff and it's like, yeah, 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 this sounds pretty good. And then all of a sudden you start you know, running into his, his characterizations of people uh, based on their own phrenology or, or whatever uh, particular thing he happened to be believing in at the time. And it's like, whoa, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't, this doesn't ring true to me. No, pe no people talk about people this way anymore. And yeah, that's true. That, that's gone out of, out of fashion. And in many cases, it's, it's abhorrent to people because they don't think it has any meaning. And, uh, and it, it, can, it can actually do damage. 
people can be labeled appropriately. Um, the strong assign the identity of the weak. This is a very important point. Uh, humans assign animal rights to animals. Animals don't assign animal rights to themselves as far as we know. Right? You don't usually hear animals talking about this because you don't usually hear animals talking. Right? It's, um, and, you know, Wittgenstein said, you know, even if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand what the lion said. Right? So it may be that the context would be so different that, you know, even if they were capable of speaking, we wouldn't know what they meant. But they don't speak, generally speaking. They don't speak, so we don't know. But you know, animal law. Who makes animal law? Humans. And they're not saying, as fellow animals, we're making this law. It's like, no, we're making this law with respect to other humans and their treatment of animals. And you know, Joe in the paper makes a, a point about the, um, you know, at, at the time the recently passed rules and regulations about chimpanzees. Um, so. You know, roles that go with identity control behavior, and the question is, is identi identity assignment justifiable? And this has become a very big deal. Stigmatization is a, uh, a serious problem. I mean, one of the reasons that people were so exercised uh, during the 1960s uh, with the civil rights movement and so forth uh, about um, the portrayal of black people and other people uh, minorities and so forth uh, in the movies and on television and so forth, and there was a kind of a big backlash against this, was that that tended to stigmatize these people. Um, you would see these things and you would say, that's what they're all like. And that's a problem because they're not all like that. So, you know, can the center hold? This again is the, is the question uh, that I raise in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Yeats poem. Um, Okay, so this is basically the slippery slope problem. This is the, a problem of not being able to hold on and to justify your assignment of identity problem. And one of the things that Joe Binding's paper talks about is the kind of uh, squishy nature of identity assignment. And in particular, once you end up getting pretty heavily into human-animal hybrids, this question of human identity shows up. How do, you, how do you make that assignment? How do you make that stick? That's, that's essentially what he's asking. So, so that's one way of looking at this paper. You know, now, you know, you can use man, bear, pig, and uh, you know, any other kinds of um, humorous segues into this. But the question is uh, not so much uh, whether or not it's possible to make sense out of it, but whether or not it's easy to make it into an absurd thing. Right? That, that, that's, the, that's the key question there, is the, the potential absurdity of the position taking. You know, there was a time when characterizations of women, for example, by, by men who didn't want women to have any rights in the society, uh, you know, we, we look at those now and we would say those are ridiculous uh, characterizations, stereotypes, or whatever. At the time, they were very commonly held. I mean, they might have been commonly held by men, but they were also held by women. Uh, many women felt, felt that way. Uh, you know, so times change. People change their views. This whole business of identity is not fixed. It, it's, it's actually not very malleable. So, questions about this? Okay, so the second way of thinking about this paper, which I call the collision course uh, way of thinking about it, um, you know, sort of goes to the same stuff and you know, the early parts of the paper uh, are still relevant. But the key, the key shift is to not talk about the portrayal, as in the case of man, bear, pig, or whatever, but instead to talk about the science. And the reason the science becomes important at this point is essentially the same question, but it's a, it framed in a somewhat different way. So this is the famous Watson and Crick paper that appeared in Nature in 1953, April 25th, 1953, that described the structure of DNA. And in, in the molecular structure of nucleic acids 
a structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid, which is you know what we think of as DNA now. And it was 1.2 pages and just a little bit over a thousand words. Very short article. Uh, can, um, uh, let's see. There's a famous uh, paragraph here. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for genetic material. It's like, oh, did we like mention that? You know, basis of life, you know, the whole thing. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they did mention that. Okay, so this was a big discovery. They subsequently won the Nobel Prize, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you can go into the details of how the DNA structure works. Um, this is a nice uh, uh, model of DNA. Um, now, do we really understand DNA at this point? Not really. Uh, for one thing, we know that there's a bunch of stuff that are called uh, exons things that we know express proteins uh, when the DNA is working, uh, transcription, uh, et cetera. Um, but there are also these large areas of DNA in between these uh, exons called introns. And one of the things that we were puzzled about was, what do they do? And for a long time, the thinking was, they don't do anything. And guess what we've discovered? Over time, we found out that these things are really important. They actually affect a lot of stuff. Um, so at first as a first approximation, this is from Wikipedia, it's possible to view introns as unimportant sequences. We don't really care about these. Uh, whose only function is to be removed. Right? They're, 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 they're vestigial. Right? They don't make any sense. They're, they're there for no reason. Uh, they're left over. Right? Well, now it's well established that some introns themselves are encoding for proteins, and some of them are regulating how and when other parts of the DNA go into action. Right? So this has a lot to do with cellular differentiation and so forth. So it's, a, it's an important thing. Now, if you were to do an analysis of how much of the DNA is in common, <laughs> 60% of my DNA as a human also is in Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. Right? So like I'm 60% fruit fly, or it's 60% me. 60% chicken, 75% rat, 80% cow, 90% cat, my cat thinks it's more like 110%, but 98% uh, chimpanzee. So would you say that a chimpanzee is 98% of a human? Hmm. That, doesn't, that doesn't seem exactly right. For one thing, I mean, despite whatever resemblance you see, uh, you know, there are some differences between chimpanzees and humans. Um, now, they're both primates. And we have recognized certain aspects of chimpanzee characteristics as, as being particularly concerning. And as a result, uh, we give chimpanzees some special prerogatives, which are explained in the paper uh, that Joe wrote. But um, genetic similarity seems to be a rather odd uh, criterion on which to base differential treatment of humans and animals because the correspondence, the similarity is really high when it comes to the great apes, right? The correspondence between humans and great apes, or, or a cat for that matter, 90%. And then you come back to this issue of what do all these different sections of DNA do? We're learning more about that all the time. And this is what makes this a collision course discussion. The person on the left is Sandra Day O'Connor. She was a Supreme Court justice. The person on the right is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's it's currently a Supreme Court justice. They have very different views on Roe versus Wade. Um, here's what the uh, an article in Slate that is still up. You can look at it if you want. Uh, in, a, in an important 1983 decision that reaffirmed Roe versus Wade, um, Sandra Day O'Connor said that 
Rho was on a collision course with itself. Improvements in technology would continually push the point of fetal viability closer to the beginning of pregnancy. Right? So if you go back and look at the Roe versus Wade decision, it was based on current medical knowledge, medical knowledge at that time. And what people in the business of uh, human gestation believed was that uh, a fetus was not viable, could not live outside the womb uh, until around the third trimester. And as a result, the Supreme Court decision said that you couldn't outlaw abortions in the first trimester, you could in the second trimester, and, and you could even have more action uh, restricting abortions in the third trimester. Um, but as uh, Sandra Day O'Connor pointed out, that's changing. That's, that, that's, that's dependent on the technology, the medical technology at the time. Right? So that's when she said that Roe was on a collision course with itself. Very interesting comment. Now, her argument was basically, even though she was supportive of abortion rights, she said that this case was not sensibly decided. That is, she agreed with the outcome, but she didn't agree with the grounds behind the outcome because there was this changing technology thing. There ought to be a more fundamental rule. And this was actually a position that um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has taken. Uh, she said that Roe versus Wade should have been decided on equality before the law grounds. Because men can't get pregnant, because men can't, will never face the decision of an abortion, uh, then uh, the same freedom that men have to not deal with this, women should have to not deal with this. Right? In other words, women should have the freedom to choose what they want to do. Um, and, you know, what did we know in 1953? Well, there was a lot that we didn't know. That's the key thing. A lot that we didn't know in 1953 that affects how we think about this business of DNA. And um, what do you know and when do you know it? So how many capital, capital crimes are there in the Pentateuch? The, this is the, the first five books of the, uh, of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament. Um, there were 10, more than 10, actually, capital crimes, things you could be put to death for. In California, there are four things that you could be put to death for at this moment. And in the state of Michigan, there aren't any things you can be put to death for because Michigan doesn't have the death penalty. Um, and interestingly enough, the same people who are trying to restrict access to abortion are the ones who are continually fighting the reinstatement of the death penalty in the uh, uh, state of Michigan. Um, Michigan has a large number of Catholics. Uh, and, uh, you know, Catholics tend to be against the death penalty, and they also are very much against abortion. Right? So um, you end up with uh, this kind of interesting um, relationship. Do, does the technology change things? Yeah, sure it does. Of course it does. Yeah. So going along the, the uh, if we follow Roe versus Wade, and, and like that, that way of thinking, Going with the Catholic argument, can you also argue the fact that the Pope can theoretically assign human identity to something? Basically saying that you know, abortion is okay or abortion is not okay? Or not? I'm not in a good position to say what the Pope can and can't do. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not like um, one or the other. I just think it's fascinating. No, because it's, it's a great point that essentially, because of Roe versus Wade, we essentially we unintentionally came up with a system for assigning the point of human identity. Right. That point forward, which is, I think, is accidental, but, but theoretically, if, if you want to use the Catholic argument as well, or any other kind of major religion that believes abortion is not okay, then doesn't technically that person or that head of power or that religious organization can also have that same power of signing your identity as well? Uh, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that when you get into the details of these religion based discussions about identity and okayness and so forth. Um, yeah, there's a lot of appeals to authority. Uh, typically, they end up being appeals to 
God's authority, which is in dispute um, across different religious beliefs. Uh, so, you know, it, so you know, some people argue that uh, sort of the postmodernist view, deconstruction, and that kind of thing, uh, argues that there is no such thing as truth. It doesn't argue that at all. Uh, no sane person would make that claim. For starters, how do, how do they know? Um, but uh, one one thing that is pretty common in uh, postmodernist argument is that you can't get people who don't agree with you to agree with you by yelling at them. Right? And that turns out to be pretty true by my experience. I mean, sometimes you can get your kids to pretend that they're going along with you by yelling at them. But you find out sooner or later that that's, they're, they're just faking it. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, you know, it's actually very interesting if you pay attention to such things. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in the Catholic Church right now about the new Pope's positions on certain things. Uh, and there are some people who've been very empowered by previous Popes who feel outraged by this new Pope saying these things, right? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's what happens when you get humans involved in stuff. Um, so, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, it's, you, you can raise questions about all of these things. Now, I will, I will tell you, I mean, Joe would tell you if he was here that he's, you know, opposed to abortion. And he's opposed to embryonic stem cell research. I mean, he's, he would fit uh, sort of the social conservative position on a number of these kinds of issues. Uh, and he deals with this whole business of animal law. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated stuff, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> it's part, that's why I assigned it. Um, so when do you cross these thresholds? I mean, that's, that's kind of a key thing. What are the thresholds that matter, and when do you cross them? And, those, and the answer to each of those questions can be, can be difficult to answer. So, um, here's just a couple of interesting sidebars, the story. Uh, the first one is this little footnote down here. We're indebted, much indebted to blah, blah, blah. And uh, Dr. R. E. Franklin and their co-workers. Uh, and then the other one is um, one of us, uh, Watkins, um, uh, uh, has um, uh, been receiving a fellowship from the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Okay. I want to just kind of explode those two stories a bit. Uh, Franklin was, was a woman. Uh, Rosalind Franklin was her name. And uh, she was probably the foremost X-ray crystallographer of the era. There are a lot of people who believe that she did not get the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick because she was a woman. That Watson and Crick could not have done the work they did without her help. And she deserved a share of the Nobel Prize, and she was denied that share because she was a woman. This was in 1953, right? And, and then she died a few years later. Um, that was a, uh, there's, that only, not only was a controversial story, it still is a controversial story. So if you want to find out a little bit about this, just put Rosalind Franklin into any search engine, and you will get a lot of stuff real quick about this whole story of Rosalind Franklin. Um, and the final thing that I want to talk about is this <clears throat> National Foundation uh, for Infantile Paralysis. This was known as the March of Dimes. You may not have heard of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, but I bet you've heard of the March of Dimes, because the March of Dimes is still around. Now, <clears throat> this is the interesting story that goes along with this kind of National Foundation for Infant Paralysis March of Dimes thing. Um, does anybody know who the powerful character was who was behind the National Foundation for Infant Paralysis? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And why would he have been concerned about this? He had polio. Polio is infantile paralysis, right? That, that, that was the common name for it. And he could not walk. He went around in a wheelchair, he got carried, and every time you see a picture of FDR, almost every time you see a picture of FDR, he's sitting. 
And that's because he couldn't stand without braces and, and help. And whenever he stood, like at a podium, he had a lot of support, you know, braces and other things to hold him up because he couldn't stand. And he was persuaded to become, in a, in a sense, the poster person for this foundation uh, by some colleagues of his who were supporters of his and liked him a lot. And they said, look, if you get behind this, uh, you, you can really make it go. Now, there were several factors that, that drove this concern about polio. First of all, polio was very non-discriminatory as, as an illness. Uh, children of rich people got it. You know, Roosevelt came from a very rich family. Uh, children, poor people got it. And it was usually children who got it. I mean, that's why it was called infantile paralysis. It was a virus, and, uh, and it would attack the uh, uh, nervous system. And, uh, you know, there's a, what's, the, what's this thing? An iron lung doesn't sound like something you want to spend a lot of time in, does it? Uh, and you know, that, that picture kind of says it. Uh, one of the things that some victims of polio uh, found difficult to do was breathe. And an iron lung was basically an uh, exoskeleton device. You'd put you in it, you know, they kind of seal it up, and the, it would pressurize and depressurize, and, and, and you would breathe as a result of this pressurization and depressurization. Now, breathing is kind of important. Uh, you kind of need to do it all the time. If you can only breathe by being inside this thing, that means you're pretty much inside that thing forever. And so there were whole hospital wards of you know, kids, basically, who were in these iron lungs. It was, a, it was a really creepy thing, and it scared the daylights out of people. It used to hit primarily in the summer. So in the summertime, when the kids want to be outside playing and stuff, this was the likeliest time to contract it and so forth. So uh, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis was the first of what we now think of as uh, fundraising organizations to fund research to attack diseases. And the National Heart Association, National Cancer uh, Foundation, and so forth have all grown up. In the, in the wake of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And they came up with this concept of the March of Dimes. Now think about this. You put together this very successful fundraising organization. They were raising very large amounts of money. And this money did go to fund Salk and Sabin and the other people who developed the um, <coughs> successful vaccines, um, one of which, the Salk vaccine, was, was tested here. And uh, University of Michigan played a major role in, in the, the development of that. So um, you, you've created this thing. People are very motivated. You've come up with this uh, very clever thing called the March of Dimes, where there's basically collection uh, boxes at um, every checkout stand of every store. Uh, and people are dropping dimes and quarters into these things. And this is you know, a time when a dime and a quarter was real money. Uh, and um, so they were raising lots and lots of money. And all of a sudden, you win. You're successful. You have a choice. Are you about polio or are you about dimes? Right? It's the march of dimes. See any polio in there? Way down here, little tiny letters, National Foundation for Power Paralysis. The, there's there's a, actually a famous book that was, was a scholarly book that was written on this <clears throat> concept of goal displacement. What the people in the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis said was, hey, we got a good thing going here. We're collecting all these dimes. We just need to retarget ourselves from polio to something that's not so easy to fix. And we can continue raising a lot of money and, and fund that thing. So they, they turned to birth defects, which is a much more generalized kind of problem. And that's, that's the or the March of Dimes went. Yeah? Uh, the biggest was not a muscular disagreement with cerebral palsy. So the two ones, the two girls, the Well, actually, this has become a very political issue. You know, who gets the money? Uh, what, what agency of the U.S. government became the largest funder of breast cancer research in the 1990s? Does anybody know? The United States Department of the Army. 
It's like, oh, yeah, sure, the Department of the Army, yeah, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. that, that goes together. How did that happen? Well, it happened because a congressperson, Patricia Schroeder from Colorado, said, hey, we've got to start pouring a lot more money into breast cancer research. She went to the National Institutes of Health, and they're like, get out of here. You know, we don't care about that. We care about, like, heart disease and prostate and stuff like that. Because uh, it was run almost entirely by men. Uh, and she finally got enough support in Congress to allocate the money, and they didn't have any place to put it. So she went to the Department of the Army and said, how about you guys take this money, and uh, what do you want? And so they told her a bunch of Army-like stuff they wanted. She got it for them, and then they took on the breast cancer thing. And it had a bunch of money immediately, uh, not immediately, but eventually transferred over uh, to NIH. But uh, it started in the Department of the Army. And these things surprise you sometimes. Any questions about that? No, Congress gave the Army money for the things that the Army wanted in exchange for the Army taking the money to do breast cancer research. Oh. Right? I mean, one of the, you know, if you know somebody who has breast cancer, you learn something about it. Uh, and one of the really interesting things about breast cancer is the, one of the creepiest things about breast cancer is also one of the best things about breast cancer, and that's that a hell of a lot of women get it. And it turns out that there's very little theory I mean, if you ask people, well, how does science work? Oh, theory. Starts with theory. No, it doesn't. Or, or at least not all aspects of science start with theory. Uh, medicine is very heavily driven by what's called translational medicine or evidence-based medicine. It's very empirical. And the fact that um, a large number of women get breast cancer every year means that you have a large pool of people who have breast cancer, which if you're a researcher, it's really awesome because there's a lot of people to study, right? And if you get a high enough population of people that you're studying, you get statistical significance even if you get way out in the bins, right? And this is exactly what's happened with breast cancer. I mean, if you do a search on, on um, breast cancer uh, evaluation or something like that, you'll, you'll end up with one of several sites that has a, uh, it's basically a thing where you enter in a bunch of data. It's a polynomial expression. It's about a six variable polynomial expression that constitutes breast cancer. Now you can do the combinatorics on that. It's pretty substantial. Um, so there's lots and lots of different combinations that are possible with uh, breast cancer, but they have statistical significance all the way out in the bins with these now. And every time they turn around, they're, they're talking about adding another one. Um, so. You know, it's like I, I said, if my wife had been diagnosed in 1999, she'd probably be dead by now. And she was diagnosed in 2009, and she's, she's still alive. Uh, and that's because of discoveries they've made as a result of, of following these things out. And uh, you know, it's, that's, that's part of the reason that the National Institutes of Health has become so popular. Uh, you know, popular enough to have its du budget doubled uh, back a few years ago. Um, so it's, you know, Nobody likes being sick and nobody wants to die. So those two things are kind of on their side. Yeah. So any questions about this Joe Biden thing? I mean, the, the, the takeaway here is that uh, there's usually, almost always, more than one way to present a topic. And the first thing that you come up with in thinking about your group presentation may not be the one you want to go with. Try to, try to come up with at least a couple of ways of, of presenting the problem and then do a little compare and contrast and you'll see, well, they, they have actually different, different effects. And uh, you know, it's something we, we can talk about if you want. Any other questions? Yeah. So the final presentation then, or is the final product going to essentially be just an argument or a, a PowerPoint presentation and then we're going to present it in the class or do you want to be a little more interactive than that? Well, um, I usually like a, a, a short write-up, like a one-page write-up, you know, just sort of an abstract uh, that, that can travel along with the, the materials so that you know, people can sort of read, this is what we're, what we're doing, this is what we're trying to accomplish, 
Um, so yeah, but you know, the, main, the main deliverable is the presentation, the performance. You know, it's not a set of PowerPoint slides. It's, it's what you do with them that's, that's key. And uh, just a warning, um, putting a bunch of text on PowerPoint slides and then standing there and reading the text, I mean, you've seen me do that. And you know you already know how boring it is. Uh, you know that's not actually the best use of of PowerPoint. Uh, there's actually not very much text on the slide. It's mostly this picture, and this picture is actually very evocative, right? So one of the things you want to think about is what are you trying to evoke? What are you trying to get people to think about? And you know when I put these, uh, um, which I'll try to do tomorrow and um, the weekend, uh, you know previous videos up of uh, presentations. Um, you know, let, I'll warn you, the video quality is not ideal, it's not perfect. I don't have fancy equipment like Jay here has. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can follow along well enough. 